Good morning, West USA. Welcome to another edition of our Monday morning podcast. We appreciate everybody joining us as yeah. the weather is now cold. Yep. Where'd, where'd fall go? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> man. It was great. It's great, yeah, though. It's summer, great. Though. That's amazing. Now now we're all complaining about how of cold course. it is. Like, we are just a bunch of babies here yeah. in Arizona. You know, so right it's <laughs> so a know. little sneak peek that we got coming up today. Of course, we got uh, Todd that's going to have the numbers later on this afternoon. So yes. pay attention to the Facebook groups and he'll get those posted. Matt Baker's here with the Bookspan Baker Teams Mortgage Minute. And then I uh, teased it a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and so we're talking about, like, if you've got a new marketing item, idea that you're considering what are the three questions that you should be asking and then we got marge Lindsay for a little mayhem with marge and i i was so tempted last night when i was putting together <laughs> to these slides it. to call a broker because oh. i'm like <laughs> oh my gosh like i don't like there's a she really outdid herself we this time. always love this section and it's been so long since we did oh my god it, it is up. i don't know it's gonna be bad so i think <laughs> todd's answering the questions first no, i'll probably get them wrong too all right as always if you got any questions or comments please feel free to email us at podcast at west usa all right let's jump into the announcements speaking of todd uh we got a business planning meeting for 2025 never too well <laughs> it's kind of late to start doing your business plan but if you haven't done one uh, you need to really work on it. And so that is coming up tomorrow from 10 to 12 p.m. at the Scottsdale office. Ooh, ooh. All right, another CE class, uh, three hours of commissioner standards. Uh, this is going to be in person at the Chandler office. That is tomorrow I between 9 title. and 12 as well. All right, Todd's got a – is this virtual? Virtual. All right, virtual CE class this Wednesday. Three hours of agency law. And as always, as we remind you, all of these events can be found on the West USA calendar. You can access the calendar through the dashboard or just go to westusacalendar.com. It doesn't matter which brokerage you are from. You definitely can attend these classes. All right. The Chandler office meeting uh, and a blanket drive is coming up uh, November. Well, the blanket drive is from November 1st to December 13th. But we've got the Chandler office meeting this Wednesday from 10 to 11 a.m. featuring Dean Becker. And it's always like that. What's making his phone ring? I don't know. He never answers. Oh, so, wow. oh I'm just kidding. I know he doesn't he answer for me. He answers for not, everybody he's else. He's not now. He must have, <laughs> he must have caller ID. <laughs> no, he actually answered for me last week, so I appreciate that. All right. Uh, Goodyear office, the family fall potluck. Uh, November 20th, uh, so bring your favorite fall dish. Uh, so that is from 12 to 2 p.m. at the Goodyear office. All righty. Um, boy, a lot of food this food, week. Yeah, I'm so excited. All right. So we've got our uh, Thanksgiving potluck Wednesday, November 20th from 11.30 to 1.30. I'm going to assume that this is for the Scottsdale office. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so we probably should start putting – the office on the flyer. You're looking at me. I don't make the flyer. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. So that is for the uh, Scottsdale office. All right. So it's a, a little bit of ways away, a couple weeks away, but uh, we just uh, release this. And so you can be one of the first ones to sign up. So uh, everything's turning into AI. And so we are doing a very, very special event uh, in the beginning of December. So you can be one of the first agents because it's going to sell out but be one of the first agents to reserve their seats by going to mindshifteventscom and you're going to learn a ton on how to leverage AI for real estate Yeah, I just want to business. shout out to Mindy. She just did that uh, TEDx talk, too, so she is all Shh, over the globe. I haven't watched it yet. Oh, man. All right. Well, you shouldn't have said it out loud. Well, she goes to this thing, and then she announces two weeks later, yeah, uh, we drove down to Kentucky and went on the bourbon trail, oh, and I'm like... Protesting. I'm like, if I'd have known... That's what was on the mar- the, the docket. I would I would have gone. I would have gone. I would have gone too. with her. But yeah. a- anyways, yes. Yeah, so, um, so get side. <laughs> so December third from uh, eleven to one thirty. All right. So just as a reminder for next week is um, is Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving. So we will not be doing a podcast next uh, week. So your th- your slide building has gotten better, Mike. Yeah, that looked really nice. Yeah, yeah. it did. 
Uh, yeah, I, I, I said I, I have reached out to Haley. I'm like, yeah, I got I got a lot of crap for my last slide. <laughs> I was gonna say this <laughs> looks goes, like a Haley. <laughs> and she goes, she goes, well, send me the slide. I want to see what it looks like. <laughs> Hey, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, okay. so yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Haley. <laughs> All righty. Uh, so like we reminded you, uh, Todd's numbers will be on Facebook uh, later Shortly on this afternoon. afternoon. All right, Matt, what's going on? All right, let's get into it. We got uh, rain rates ticked up a little bit more uh, mm-hmm. week over week, which is always, a, you know, I know bad news from my perspective. Uh, but, uh, you know, look, rates are going to be ebbing and flowing. I'm going to talk a little bit about why um, here in the next couple of slides because I feel like there's some – underneath stuff that probably is worth talking about because you're probably getting questions on from your clients wh- wh- why are the fed lowering rates but rates going up like right. that doesn't you know it's kind of counterintuitive so here's where we are from a you know a, a, a candlestick perspective you see that like really if you track back to that september 16th area that's when we had the best rates and that's right when the fed lowered rates and look at since then the the red all that red means rates have worsened and so that ride down or up if you flip it upside down because this is always in reverse rates have have really bottomed uh and you know when i say rates have moved it's remember it's not the interest rate that moves it's the cost of the rate that moves so in reality we're sitting right around 100.5 and at the best we were getting close to 102.25 so you know, that's been almost a one and a half, one and three quarter percent in cost move. So on a $400,000 loan, it's going to cost about seven, seven grand more for that same rate. If you want to think of it from like a dollar perspective, but you know, one of the big things just over last week was the consumer price index. And you saw that that did tick up now went from 2.4 to 2.6. And one of the things that always happens is you replace numbers from the, the, the year before. So October of 23 was replaced and that was a zero. So what happens when you replace a zero with a positive number? Well, it's going to go up naturally. So it did tick up, but the core has remained stubbornly above three, which is really where, you know, the Fed still lowered rates, you know, last week or the two weeks before. So it's like, well, what does that really, what, what does that really mean? And, you know, one of the things, and this is the Fed funds rate. So this is the Fed lowering rates on the very far right side. You could see how they lowered rates and it sort of, you know, was 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 topped out there and then kind of did a little tick. You can kind of barely see that on there. But if you look back to ev- before every gray area, well, maybe except for 90, what happened is the market, you know, the Fed starts to lower rates, but then those gray areas are recessions. So you're like, okay. Uh, what's happening? Are we going to soft land? Are we not going to soft land? What does a soft landing really mean? It just means that are we going to not get into a recession? Is economic growth going to still maintain enough before the, you know, before that market reaction reaction, and we we go into a recession? And the reality is, we just want lower rates, right? And so, in theory, you'd almost like to just give me the bad news. Let's get to where we should be in a rate that's going to be a balanced market and and be and be that. But one of the big things that's been a result of that is the election. And what's happening now is that the, you know, the 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 thought is, you know, the market moves in projection of what's to come, and so. Right now, with the House and the Senate and the President all being Republican red, they're talking about, well, now these policies are going to be causing, you know, they're inflationary, right? So if you do tariffs, the things are going to cost more. So some of the policies that Trump traded on early in his, you know, in his campaign is now causing the market to second guess our rates should be rates lower. And so what you're seeing is you're seeing that the, the market is actually reacting preemptively to what may or may not actually come to pass, right? Because you don't really know. I mean, we're talking maybe a year away from some of those policies even coming into the market. So I think there's a lot of like speculation speculation on the on the bad side or on the increased rate side, no, not knowing what is going to occur with some of these, you know, policies, Trump things over the first maybe 100 days. So obviously that's January 20th when he gets into office. And so then you're talking about April. So what between now and April, where are we going to land? And and still yet the Fed lowered rates the last time and they're talking about maybe raise, you know, lowering rates again in December. So where does that sit us? And I think it just kind of puts us right into a wedge between, I don't think there's a win-win here. I think... 
go ahead. No, I was just going to say, if you look back to 1995 um, yep. and you see where that flat line is. Now, we don't look at the 80s because we know that was a crisis. My interest rate back then was 13.9%. Right. So, you know, 1995 and on, if you look at the, the plateau, uh, 1995, 2005 to 2007, and then again now, 2022 to today, those are plateaus. Those are This is what the market was all through the 90s and into the mid-2000s, you know, only until we saw the, the, uh, the mortgage-backed security crisis, which then, of course, was that other one. So I, I don't look at it the same. I look at it as, sure, election period results I totally get, but I look at the historical perspective and the overlays, and I'm sitting here going, yeah, you know, we're probably where we belong as far as Fed rate's concerned. What we're really screwed up with is all the other things, the, you know, the, the, the uh, costs of things that are really causing it to be... And the trade imbalance, inexpen- right? Well, that's exactly and, the and point. And the deficit and all the other things. Absolutely. Because you have to create bonds in order for, for you know, rates then in turn go up mm-hmm. to pay for all this spending that we have yeah. um, in, you know, as a government. And in each of those plateaus, we brought jobs back into America. Right. So, so, so we'll see, right? Yeah, we'll see. I mean, and, and obviously, so, so I guess the long and short of it is um, I don't really have a crystal ball and mine no, is foggy, yeah. and, and, but I'm still hanging my hat on data. Mm-hmm. And I do believe that at some point over the next 10, 20, 100 days, that interest rates will start to ebb back down into the fives uh, and sixes. I mean, obviously, you can see that we are, we're in the sevens now, so definitely into the sixes. I don't know if you know we'll get to the fives, maybe on a 15-year loan. Um, but anyway, so that's uh, that's uh, kind of the little bit of the market. And then I, I, I saw this, and the last time I showed this, I think we were at 30 times higher as a homeowner versus a renter. And you could see that from 2019 to 2022, it's really starting to, to skyrocket the value, the gap between the renter and a homeowner. And so again, just maybe a good screenshot to talk to your people who are on the fence that are worried about a seven versus a six in front of their interest rate that you know you can convince them that you know there's still a pretty big wedge gap here between being a homeowner and about you know your net worth in relationship to renting and then as always we've got our uh, next pulse which is academy housing and rates where we do a deep dive in december and then there is my contact card if you have questions i'm happy to help very cool all right, um, I'm a big uh, Barry Habib fan. Um, I love Barry wh- Habib. Yeah, when so. uh, when does he think rates are going to come down? Well, you know, as most prognosticators, they haven't really. You know, he's been calling for lower rates this whole year, and they haven't really come to pass. Um, but he is ben- banking on the fact that every November, the last three Novembers or last two Novembers, rates have improved. Now we haven't started to see that yet. But I'm still holding out hope that by the end of Thanksgiving, we've got a little bit better rates than we do today. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, that, didn't really answer, good stuff. that didn't really answer your question at all. But that's, that's what... <laughs> Who is answering yeah, that question? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, that's yeah. why I was saying that way you weren't having to give any predictions. I was right. just asking for right. his predictions, so I was yeah. protecting you there. You were. You were. I was looking out for you. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. Looking out for number yeah. five. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know what that means either. I have no idea. <laughs> all right. Let's jump into Thanks, the three-pack. So a couple weeks ago, in case you missed it, we talked about business plans, but in the sense of before you start putting together a 2025 business plan, uh, what three questions should you be asking? And so if you're attending uh, Todd's class tomorrow or going to another business planning class, I'd highly recommend uh, you going on YouTube and looking at uh, our podcast from two weeks ago and our three pack. So with that, Todd and Nick, I said, okay, so what happens? I got a new marketing idea. This agent comes in or this title rep comes in and says, hey, here's this new Shiny idea. Object. Uh, what three questions should you be asking yourself? Um, and so number one is, is what should I be asking first? Uh, really kind of where did the idea come from? Uh, whether if a title rep is, is presenting it, but really where is that idea coming from? Who do I know? And this is always the thing. It's like if, if I'm considering a new, new marketing or new advertising idea, who do I know that is doing it uh, that I could speak with? Um, what kind of success have they had? What kind of obstacles have they had? Would they do it again? That's always yeah, my that's big question. Uh, w- w- would I do this again, or would you do this again, knowing what you know now? And always just take some time to find some agents that are doing these things 
and and speak with them. You don't want to go in, you know, completely blind. Absolutely. You know, I love the last one. Have I spoken to them about it? Meaning the people who are actually doing it. You're going to get the honest answers from them. But here's the funny thing I always see, because the people that are selling this stuff to you are salespeople as well. And, you know, these people are sitting there back going, oh, hey, this great zip code in 85383 just came available. Do you know 85383? That's like the highest, second highest uh, per capita income, blah, 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 blah. You know, and they go through all these big things. You're like, oh my gosh, got to have that. But do you? You know, is it going to derail or distract you from what your plan is this year? Um, and, and that's really what we're, we've all been talking about. But I, I think in this particular perspective, uh, you have to know where the problem was that this supposed lead generation idea is going to come from. Uh, you know, if it can identify a problem in the industry and it can bring a solution or you're the solution, it, which is them reaching out to you as a result of that marketing piece, uh, then, it, then, it, then pretty much anything can work. But the question is just what's the, what's the rate of return on it? So without seeing the other two and three, I, I, I think we might be dancing around a couple things. So if I start to go too far, Mikey, just smack, smack me. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Um, I think number one, whenever you're going to get yourself and your business into a new marketing or lead source, you need to look at your business. And like Todd said, does it make sense for your current real estate business? And if it doesn't, why then are you looking to pivot outside what you have found success on? Now, if you're not closing the transactions that you think you should be, then maybe that's the solution that Todd was discussing is you want to close more deals. If this is going to do that, again, never walk into anything blind. Have the conversation. Do the research. If the lead generation company that's reaching out or the individual that's marketing this to you doesn't offer you to speak to current clients, yeah. I would be concerned because they point. should be doing that because they should be proud to bang their chest. And then how long are you going to be able to commit dollars, time and resources into this new marketing idea lead source? If it's not yeah. a, a, more than Good a couple point. of weeks, a couple of months, then you're wasting your time. Good yeah, I, as, as, that's a great point. Um, I, something I didn't even think to put on there is if, if you are actually are talking to the sales rep like who can I talk with mm -hmm. and then one of the one of the questions at any time we you know my partner and I Ryan Gertis we we talk to a new company or leads or whatever the case is or or talking to somebody's actually implemented this uh, asking yep <laughs> uh, and it's such a number two how am I going to implement it so what you know what is my projected success? Um, and that goes back to point number one, speaking to people who've, who've already implemented it. it. And, in, and then if I sit down with this rep, or now I'm, I'm getting ready to think about, seriously consider this lead source, what are my next steps? Literally outlining, outlining the steps of, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to have X amount of money in place. I might need to make adjustments in my CRM system. I might have to purchase some additional marketing collateral or, or having somebody build something out and, uh, you know, and then building out that implementation plan. So you could sit down and, and you got a checklist, you got a step-by-step. -step. These are the things that I need to do um, because it's really hard to project success and le unless you've actually built out the plan because the plan's going to include, you know, uh, what kind of exposure? How many people is this going to get me in front of? How many real estate conversations is this going to generate? How many how many appointments is this going to possibly lead to? Um, and then yeah, and then you know, have I done enough research on on this? I, I think we just do a lot of this stuff blindly. We do a lot of this stuff because another agent's done it and had great success, and so we think, oh, I'm just going to go do it. We don't put a lot of thought to it, and it doesn't work for us, and then we kind of give up on it. Yeah, and, and to that first point, again, answering the second one, second question, is of that person that you talk to, are they still doing it or did they get out of it? And, and what were the reasons why? Just because they left it didn't mean it really maybe didn't work. Mm -hmm. It just meant it didn't work, as Nick and I said earlier, to, to our business. It wasn't something that, that, you know, that that particular person wanted to do in their business. Um, but, Mike, I think this is next to exit strategies. This is probably one of the most important things you have to consider in absolutely anything you do because the word implement equals time, and time 
is either well spent or poorly spent. And if it's well spent, you should have some kind of a return. If it's poorly spent, you're, you're just wasted your time. And again, it turned out to be a distraction. So uh, when you know the lead generation statistics for that particular thing, mm -hmm. uh, then you can track it and you can hold it accountable, hold your money accountable and your time accountable. You know, Nick, you know, you know my personal feelings on these closed Facebook groups for real estate agents, but this is this is the one uh, area or or one thing that the, the Facebook groups do offer me, because if I do come across it, like I there was a, there was a a lead gen source that I, I kept seeing pop up, and people said they did really well with it, uh, and I know better than just to go buy it and whatever. And I went on the website and checked things out, but then. Um, I was able to go on these Facebook groups. I look at the people who posted, said that they've been using it, and then connect with them through direct messaging and, and have conversations with them. And so just the point is, is really doing your research and really, and you know, and asking them, well, how did you build this out? And, and how, you know, and so forth. Well, and that's what those Facebook groups should, should be exactly. used for. Right. Right. Complaining and whining and, and calling out your peers is not the correct way avenue. Um, so how am I going to implement? This is this is the big conversation. I mean, what is my projected success? What does success look like for you and your business? That is a question that you need to answer before you start this. Is it a few transactions, one a month, 12 for the year, building your pipeline? You need to know the answers to that because if you're talking about this lead gen source and they're talking about how many inquiries you're going to be able to put into your pipeline, those aren't closings. Those aren't, those aren't transactions. Those are people that you're going to talk to. So if you you're on the wrong page of what their goals are for you. You've already started off on the wrong foot. And then have you built out your implementation plan? Implementation plan? You need to be as intentional as you possibly can be on how you're going to roll this out. And just as importantly, what happens if you get a lead from this program? What are you going <laughs> to do then? And the amount of time that you're going to need to put in in the front end is going to be much more than you anticipate. So you need to carve out a lot of time to build this out build your plan, get it working. And then as you do it correctly, your systems then should then take over and the time on the back end should be less. But you have a lot of work to do before you even start to have leads filter into your systems. It's, a, it's an interesting point, Nick, because Todd, I think one of the things that we never include in these implementation plans are scripts. Yep. So to, to Nick's point, what if I do get a yeah, lead? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what am I, I going to say? Uh -oh. You yeah. know, because because knowing where the lead comes from is going it, it, to it's going to determine what the script looks like. Right. And um, yeah, yeah, I think that's what we said in, in question number one. To be honest with you, is you know what problem is it solving? You know, I mean, what problem is a consumer having? And then what problem is it solving? When the people call you, when you get that reaction to the advertisement that means it's working, what are you saying? Because if you drop that ball and you aren't mm -hmm. delivering or preparing them to, then yeah, you're not going to get the success. Uh, all right, and what is my cost and time? Because um, it's not always enough just to focus on how much something is going to cost me. Yep. Uh, but we don't take into account time. And, and time starts with, well, how much time do you currently devote to your business? That's the first question that you got to ask. And so if I'm only devoting, let's say, 30 hours a week um, – can I increase that time or do I need to cut something at the biggest questions? How much is this going to cost me and do I have the budget for it? Um, where's that money going to come from? Um, because any new, new, I don't know of a sort of idea that is going to give you instant gratification. They take time to roll out. We tell people, if you're going to canvas a neighborhood with postcards and stuff, it's a minimum of nine months of consistency. Correct. So do you have the budget for it? Um, and like I said, well, I need to adjust my time for my other marketing strategies. And you mentioned it earlier, Todd. This is this has always been my Achilles heel all these years. Um, and I ha I've had to get really... I had to get a lot better of not pulling the ripcord in time. Like I, I, if I think an idea is really good, 
I will write, and and there's just no data to support that the idea is working. But if I think it's really good, yeah. I will just keep at it and trying to force it. And it's something it's that's always been a struggle of mine, but something that I've had to improve on over the years of saying, okay, we're going to start this, and we're going to give it twelve months, or we're going to give it six months, or we're going to give it eighteen months, and and and. This is these are the results that we're looking for to know that it was worth our time and worth our money. And if that time period comes and we're not getting those results, then I've got to pull the ripcord at it's, some point. You know, it's kind of like when you're having those conversations back with those people that are using it again. Another great another great question is how long did it take you mm. to develop business from it and how much money were you spending at it throwing at it you know um you know if we throw 16,000 pieces of mail at somebody every sing, uh, you know every single month for 12 years uh, 12 months rather we should end up with 361 transactions we know that what this means as far as like eddm direct mail things like that if you do a tenth of it you can't expect 321 you can mm. only expect the tenth of the result so you have to kind of figure out that time invested money invested how long does it take or better yet how long should, if it took you six months doing this, and I'm going to double down on that, I should probably get business in three to five. If I'm not getting that business in three to five, maybe that's my ripcord. Maybe that's no. when I go, hey, pff, I got to be out of this because I'm not getting the return I anticipated. In an effort to keep it simple, stupid on this, I, I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but if you're navigating your business and you're, you're looking at your business as a business owner, you should have a general idea of how much you're making per transaction. Absolutely. So when you get that, that number per closing, that's, that's kind of what you need to make sure that you're getting close to on these systems. If you're putting in double what your average commission earned is on a transaction into a marketing source, that means that if leads do start coming in, you've got to continue to working with it for X amount more time. Time, putting in yeah, so it's it's your your cost estimate needs to be something that you're looking at, but it does also include a little bit of analytics on your business. Now, the the my cost and my time. I, I saw a post this weekend on on one of the bigger national forums. It was an agent. I went door knocking for three hours. I got zero leads. Never doing that again. Well, yeah, that is a waste thing. of yeah. your time. Then, right. if you weren't committed to doing door knocking every Saturday for three hours for the next six months, why even start? Yeah. Well, so. That Okay. I mean, having those conversations with yourself, but setting those benchmarks, writing them down, making it a thing that you're going to do, not just you're going to try it out. And maybe that's what this, this goal was. But again, going on social media and yelling about it was a little weird. Um, and it's just making sure that you know what is your budget for time and for money. Those are very important things that you need to set in the beginning. And learn what you bring to the table. Yeah. I mean, what is your gift? Um, you know, Mike, I also just want to I don't think I've ever done this. Uh, it's well, Thanksgiving it. week, so I do. I want to thank you. And I, well, the reason I want to thank Mike is because he is transparent. He's act, I hate that word. He, he comes here being self-effacing. He comes here saying, you know, here's what I do wrong. Here's what I needed to overcome. He brings himself to you, to all of our listeners, every single week when he does these three packs. And, you know, and, and that's rare. And he's that guy that who you speak to, <laughs> you know, that, that'll actually tell you the truth. But, you know, this is so important. You got to look, check your behavioral assessment out. Go to westusadisc.com. Pick another one. Because I'll tell you, that guy that was doing door knocking, he might be great retail sales sitting in an open house. But maybe he's horrible mm -hmm. going up in field sales and knocking on a door. He just yeah. doesn't like it. And if you don't like it, the odds are you're not going to do well. And that it. goes back to point number one. Yep. Are you going to completely derange, derail your business because of something that's shiny and bright? Now, my last point on this, as someone who gets a lot of these calls, I know Todd does as well for West USA, this is the time of year people are trying to finalize their year-end quota sales. So agents, be prepared. You're going to start getting a lot of these. And they're in sales too. So don't knee-jerk. Don't let them push the well. If I get you signed up by the end of the year, you get this discount. Do your research yeah. first. I appreciate it, Todd. Thank you nice for the kind ones. words. Nick, you should uh, strive to be a little bit more like me, apparently. <laughs> no. <laughs> he's, too, he's too busy uh, protecting himself from short jokes. <laughs> Todd, See, you're I, minded him. I was you're literally, minded him. I said, I'm not even going to do a Sorry, short yeah. joke today. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, so forth. don't. All right. It's Thanksgiving week. All right. Um, so, well, Marge, welcome back. Yeah, I'm afraid now. Oh, she's not on. Hold on. Okay. Uh, now, now we, we got you. Okay. Sorry, I'm new. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I I was going through these, uh, and I and I do I, I glance at the questions because I I put pictures yeah. on them and, yeah. and I'm trying to get the feel for it. And the first couple ones, I'm like, yeah, this is gonna be this is this is fine. And then towards the end, I'm like, I really don't know. Uh, so kudos yeah. to you, but we'll see how we do. And I did not call a broker, nor did I. Uh, 
look up anything. So um, we'll see what happens. And even at this point, I've forgotten what the questions were. <laughs> All right, so uh, so if you're new to West USA or new to our podcast, uh, Marge Lindsay is our director of education here at West USA, uh, one of the most experienced and knowledgeable uh, agents probably in the nation, and uh, and one of our managing brokers. And so, Marge, it's so good to have you. When you're so kind, it makes me nervous. Give me, hold on, wait for it, wait for I, it. No. I know. I know. <laughs> All right, I know it's coming. So we do uh, mayhem with Marge. Uh, she gives us five um, scenarios, and Todd and I try to figure out uh, What's the right what, answer? The, what the right answers are. <laughs> or run. Yeah. All right. So scenario one: I have a listing that was inherited by four siblings when their mother passed away. So apparently that mother didn't like her kids. And there means it wasn't the listing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the four decided that one of the siblings would be the one to handle the entire transaction. Do I have to get signatures from all four on the listing, contract, and other documents as they come up? And this would be, the answer to this would be a, it depends. It depends on who's on title to the house or how do, how is the trust created and whether that trust gives the authorization for one of the siblings to speak, negotiate, and, and sign on behalf of the others. Ooh, so um, this would be, I'd be on the phone with my attorney right away. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we go take a break? <laughs> yeah, I know. Gosh, Mike. You know, That's what I said. I the know. first couple. Don't, don't, get, don't well, get used to this. Well, no, but the best, you know... It, the answer, the way the question structured, if you were taking the real estate test at the state, you would not have all the information you need to answer this question. And Mike, that's why you nailed this thing out of the yeah. park. Um, so, you know, you can break it down just a little bit, but it really does answer. Uh, if inherit was a keyword, you know, uh, typically, obviously, it could have been probate. It could have been mm -hmm. uh, a trust, a family trust. Uh, it could have been a beneficiary deed on that property that automatically conveyed interest to them upon demise uh, to what? Like you said, Mike, one, two, three, all four of the siblings. Um, you know, so there were a lot of little trick questions just in that very first sentence. There could have gone many, many different ways. If they decide that if by chance they have the authority of the four of them, if they decide to pick one of them to handle the transaction, then yes, you'd want to have a document signed by all four, well, yeah, all four people, because even the person who that authority has been given to needs to accept that authority. So, you know, you'd have that. Uh, should they all sign the listing? No, we all know that. Any one person can sign, any one of the owners can sign a listing contract, provided they have the authority to do so. Um, the contract, again, depending upon what that uh, that durable power of attorney might have said or whatever the uh, LLC or trust document was that gave that one person the signing authority or all of them or the trustee themselves. And, uh, you know, any other documents that would be based on any other document that comes up. How'd, how'd Mike do, March? No, you, you both did an excellent job. Mark. I mean, you honestly covered every single point I might have wanted to make uh, with this. Yeah, Throw I know. one up, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, yeah, so far it's great. Okay. But, you know, because there are times, too, one of the circumstances that we heard about where there were three siblings, and they went to an attorney, got a power of attorney, giving the one the right and the authority to sign it all so that it spared everybody the grief. But during that process, the one said, I quit because the other two are making my life so miserable and they're arguing with me on every point that I make that it just isn't worth it. They can have it. I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, sadly, there are a lot, of, a lot of different circumstances when something like this comes up. And it's sad, too, because oftentimes money brings out a different side of people than you would have ever known exist. So that's, that's a fact. Yeah, that's why you want to take it very seriously. And it's good when you ask ahead of time to know exactly what you need to do. But you guys, you really did hit it. I like the graphic, part. Mike. You know, uh, rain boots, you know, bad weather's coming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I was looking for a, a picture of four kids in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in the octagon. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's another thing. It matters on how old the ch the four siblings are. Well, <laughs> that's a little so, there. <laughs> um, would you advise us? What what I would also do in this situation, if I obviously I would probably be the listing agent in this situation, 
is to collect all the documentation that they have and send it to my title company ahead of time so that their legal department can review it because I'm not I, I may read the documents but I'm I'm sure as heck not going to offer an opinion. Right, and the title companies can have differing requirements. Some will accept certain documents, others prefer others. So that's also that's an excellent point. point. Yeah. All right, number two, a good friend and former client contacted me to list his house because he's accepted a job offer in another state. After he moved into this house, he and his wife became good friends with their neighbor, and he is also an agent with another company. The seller would like us to co-list the property. The neighbor agent is fine with doing this. May I do it? I got nothing. Yeah, you do. Well, it's I, the first place I, you would go. Oh, well, on, well, well my, my, my first gut, gut instinct yeah. would be no, absolutely not. And even, even if the Department of Real Estate or, you know, yeah, would permit it, I can't see West USA allowing us to do this because they won't even allow me to hold an open house for another broker. Or another broker to hold one of ours. That's true. So the first place you'd go would be to your broker. Um, if it didn't already say it in your policy and procedure manual, um, which would be the first place I would probably go. Um, you know, it's just like, could you, if we had a property here in, uh, at, uh, West USA and we, and the property that we had that we just took a listing on for the client that lives next door to us, uh, was on a property in Payson. Could we do a, a, a dual uh, arrangement with a different company with an agent in Payson to assist in doing it. You'd have to have a lot of details and a lot of information, and I'm not sure anybody really wants to touch that, but it's potentially possible. And yet, I think it would be ill-advised totally. you know, to do something yeah. like that. I don't see enough of a difference in doing something like that because it's different MLS versus the confusion and the problems that it potentially could Creates, create. Yeah. So, you know, and, and this this was one where when I talked with our agent, he said, you know, he's a good client. He likes me. He likes the way I've done my business. And I'm honored that he came back to me. But he also likes his next door neighbor and they've developed a friendship. And he said his finest compliment was that he'd like both of us to work for him. So we said, that's fine. And, and it was actually kind of like, I hate to say it, but Mike's on a roll. But <laughs> it's kind of like you said when, you know, your first instinct is to say no, because, yeah, our company policy would prohibit that. And for a lot of different reasons, and among the things that we explained, okay, whose sign are you going to put out there? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. MLS only allows you to have one listing in there when it's active. And then who is representing whom in that case? You know, and, and who has the fiduciary duties and responsibilities? Who's the agent for them and so forth? There are just so many different aspects that we truly need to think about. So our recommendation is, instead of this, decide uh, between the two of you, because he said he really likes the other agent also. Decide which of you is going to be the listing agent which one is going to have the sign out there, what your duties and responsibilities are going to be, and work it on a 50% referral basis. You know, that, that's exactly correct, because we used to do this all the time. You know, Mike, um, you're at a listing appointment. Ryan would get this also. He'd nail this one, too. Um, you're at a listing appointment, and the list seller says, I've got a child, a friend uh, that I want, you know, that's in the business, and I really would like to give the business to them, and they're brand new. You know, and the question is, well, can you know, we, we know all the things to ask. Well, could you fire them? What's that going to do to your relationship? Blah, 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 blah. But the reality is, what happens if you said, I'll tell you what, if, if you really believe that they have, could have an influence, I'll list the property for you and sign a referral agreement with them uh, that, uh, you know, I may compensate them a certain percentage of my compensation, uh, you know, just for being a participant. But I've had that work multiple, multiple, multiple yeah. times for a very low you know, almost unrealistic referral fee. All right, Marge. So assuming <clears throat> that we could replace the word company with brokerage. So there, so he's also an agent with another brokerage. So because that term is going to be important for my next question. So assuming West USA says no, that we can't do this. What about our franchise up in uh, Prescott 
that flies under the West USA banner, but has a different designated broker. Is That's still one and the same. There's, okay. There's yeah. no difference. It's yeah. two separate it's companies, company. two yeah. separate brokers. Uh, it's just that in that particular case, you know, they're smart enough to align themselves with West USA. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Look who's talking, Mark. Yeah. All right. Number yeah. number three. See, this is where this is now getting into due diligence periods and inspections. Such fun oh, stuff. Oh man. <laughs> All right. So I am representing a buyer. We wrote a contract that was accepted, and we are now past our due diligence period. Today, the listing agent called to tell me that he that his seller is not willing to pay for the owner's title policy, the HO, the homeowners association. Okay, sorry, the owner's title policy. In addition, uh, the HOA has just told the seller that they have to repaint the exterior of the home. What are my buyer's options now that the due diligence time frame has run out? You didn't like the way I phrased it. Oh, this is so good. Yeah, to me it was just kind of funny because they said, Oh, "Oh, by the the way. way." Yeah, so matter of fact. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So what are my buyer's options now that that the due diligence time period has run out? So I, there's two things here. I mean, number one, the owner's title policy, if the seller has already agreed to it, it's not negotiable. The The painting is the interesting one here um, because now that is new and material information that could uh, affect the buyer's decision to move forward. And if, I don't know whether it's five or ten days So, because I'm not a broker, but... <laughs> I have, even if the inspection period period has expired and my buyer gets new material information, which this is because this is a big ticket item, then they, they have the right to obviously negotiate it, but at the end of the day, they could cancel the contract So, if the seller is unwilling to budge. Contractually, the term is changes. And in the changes section of the contract, it would say that the buyer has the right for five days to review any new information, any new information that the seller provides the buyer. Hill versus Jones, a court case in Arizona, said that a that material fact was defined as any information that a reasonable buyer may use to make a decision to purchase or the price they pay for the home. So it is. Anything almost is a material fact, or potentially could be, if the buyer chose to use that as a reasonable reason why they would not want to buy the home or, or move forward. You know, the HOA thing, the, the, the contract also says that the seller will deliver the home in the same condition as it was as of the date of contract. You know, maybe the buyer should have paid a little more attention maybe to that, but wouldn't that kind of be handled like an assessment, meaning the HOA is going to fine you if you don't, you know, paint the home within a reasonable period of time? Um, and then as far as it relates to the title policy issue, yes, it was already established in the terms that was a part of the covenant that the that the seller had with the buyer was that the seller agrees to blah 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 uh, do the title policy. Um, I think it, you're right, Mike. Anything ultimately can be used to potentially destroy the transaction, even though it's going to get ugly uh, if there's no contract term to deal with it. Um, but maybe they could. Uh, uh, well, so th- I'm going to just leave it with that because the actual answer I don't know that there is one yet. So, Marge? Well, when you say this, there are answers for it. And with the owner's title policy, yes, the contract does say that the seller is going to provide this, you know, for the buyer. And when you say if if it's in there as far as the contract is concerned and it's not negotiable, that's technically perhaps a true statement. But at the same time, if you have a seller that now changes their mind and says, no, we're not going to do it. We're not going to pay for it. Okay, so now what are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> you know, because we can't force them to do what they contractually agreed upon. So in that particular case, if nothing else, a three-day cure would set us up if, if you know, we look at nothing else. But then with the HOA, with this, I don't see the buyer having any fault because the way it was posed, which this doesn't clearly state, but the way this was posed, the when the listing agent called and said, oh, by the way, my 
seller says that they got a notice from the homeowners association. So apparently that was not known ahead of time, and it is, as you say, material, and it can cost a lot. Let's see, mine um, with my home, <laughs> it was mere eleven thousand four hundred to repaint the exterior. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it is. It's a big ticket item, and that is something that you're correct. They have five days after receipt of this new information to determine whether they're going to proceed. And people keep saying, well, why are we giving them five days? Well, they're now, they, the buyers now, will have some time if they want it, if they need it, to go out and find out what is the cost to me if I agree to these changes. So so let's imagine that the buyer's like, yeah, you know, we were going to paint the home anyway. We really don't like it. It looks, you know, we want to change the color, whatever. Um, and so the only issue was the title policy. Uh, you were told about it. Um, you have five days for new information to, you know, do whatever you may. Um, first of all, you might want to talk to a real estate attorney about your options, your risk, your, your potential options as a buyer's agent. One of them, could it not maybe be that the seller fails to perform as of the close of escrow day where the buyer could sue for specific performance to make them sign that document? Well, can you make them sign the document, well, though? Well, no, but I specific mean, we're right performance, at least you'd get have a court day in court about it. Well, the one thing that I like when you bring up specific performance, one of the misnomers and I, I called an urban legend, is that specific <laughs> performance yeah. has no teeth, right. that it's not viable, that it's not something you can rely on. That is so untrue because it is very real, and any of the good real estate attorneys will tell you that they fend for th- you know with these things often. So is that a possibility? Yes, it's a possibility. But then there are so many... Uh, different options and so many different twists and turns that can come up. That yeah, why spend five thousand to pay for an eighteen hundred dollar owner's title exactly. policy? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, is it appropriate for me to, if, if I'm showing a property to a potential buyer and we see that the paint is questionable, and obviously at that point we don't know how sensitive the HOA is and and, and things like that. For the buyer or the agent to call the HOA and just say, "Hey, we're thinking about buying this property. What are your thoughts on the paint?" and 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 then the HOA goes out and goes, "Oh yeah, this paint's bad." And next thing you know, the seller gets a notice. Too bad. Because yeah. <laughs> I, 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 mean, I do this. <laughs> yeah. No, my immediate reaction is, I would have, I would be pleased to have a buyer that took it that seriously and would look Mm -hmm. at it because they enjoy everybody into litigation or threats down the road if it happens. But that'd be fine. And if that happens, it's unfortunate. But there there was no malice or, you know, ill intent. So I would say that'd be fine. Okay, because the last thing I need is my buyer's clothes, escrow, and then two weeks later, they get that notice from the HOA. Sure. And um, and and obviously, you can tell. You go to some houses; it, it doesn't need paint. But some houses we go to, you're like, hmm, you know, <laughs> this could this is this could be questionable. And again, at that point, we don't necessarily know how aggressive and how sens- sensitive the HOA is, sure. and so forth. Well, so. it also runs, Mike. That was a good point. That was really, really a great recommendation. And I'll mm-hmm. tell you why, because does an agent have a fiduciary duty to know what they know and quote unquote what they should have known and by being an agent who deals with HOAs which most communities have HOAs out here should an agent maybe not I mean shouldn't they have known they should have advised their buyer of that and maybe sent it in writing to protect themselves I don't even know how to spell fiduciary so (laughs) all right scenario number four I am representing a buyer who had his contract accepted this was this was a good one Okay, so I'm representing a buyer who had his contract accepted with a contingency to sell their house as part of the negotiations. When should I schedule the home inspection? Should I do it immediately or after the contingency has been removed? We are told that waiting could be devastating because the buyer may find that much has to be done. That much has to be done now. They need to cancel this and rush to find a replacement. With the inventory fairly low and competition strong, should we factor that in too? Todd? (laughs) (laughs) Set me up for the slam dunk. I'm like, okay. No. Um, 
Well, you know, okay. <laughs> so she, when should you schedule the home inspection? According to the terms and conditions of the contract, period, end of story. Um, if you were smart enough or maybe you thought it was important enough or prudent enough or you're maybe not even you but your buyer to have recommended a different home inspection date, range, um, then that would be, again, according to the addendum or terms of the contract. Immediately or after the contingency has been removed. Well, depends on what contingency document you're using. So some contingency documents may may include some of that language, which you know as well as I do, an addendum would supersede any of the boilerplate in the prior document. Uh, maybe, uh, I, but I do agree with one thing. If you wait to the end and then your inspection period discovers something that, you know, is is would have been one of those items that had you known it, you wouldn't have gone this far to begin with. And now your property is on a contract closing in 30 days. Yeah, I think I think that would it would be prudent to do it within the original terms and conditions of the contract. Yeah, and, and obviously this is one of those scenarios. Everything is negotiable, yeah, and and and, and, and it's going to be <laughs> a meeting of the minds. But as a listing agent or as the seller in this, it, it's everybody knows that it is risky to take it's a little riskier to take a contract based on a contingency because there's so many now other things that could go wrong and and, and so forth um, and so if I was advising the client or I was the seller I would stick the buyer to the 10-day inspection period I want them to have skin in the game um, because there's because the contingency is the contingency. A lot of bad things can happen, and a lot of buyers can just do it just to maybe lock up the house. And I, I just want to make sure they got skin in the game. Let's also just make sure that that you know what's the order of the dominoes anyway. The order of the domino is the the buyer's house has to close for them mm -hmm. to have the proceeds to move forward. So realistically, no matter what home where they buy, they always have to sell their home first. So that's priority number one for the buyer. You know, uh, you know from the seller's perspective, yeah, I would think the seller would want the buyer also to do all their diligence up front mm -hmm. uh, just to remove any speculation. Just with And the buyer's protection is that prior to the close of escrow, the home has to be delivered or occupancy has to be delivered in the same condition. So if that were the case, anything that goes wrong in the meantime is more of a seller's uh, potential risk than the buyer. Well, and the thing that I thought of when this came up more than anything is as a listing agent and or a buyer's agent, I need to have conversation with my client. I need to point out these risks. I need to point out the potential for these things to happen, especially if there's a time constraint. Because the vast majority often are told, wait until after the contingency has been removed, because who knows what could happen between now and the time that that's sold, and would you need another inspection? Would you need a re-inspection? And so you've got this. Is the seller going to start negotiating repairs and all of these other things with you right now when your contingency hasn't even been removed? Mm -hmm. Buyers don't want to put the money up front mm -hmm. yep. with the uncertainty. So to me, it could be any or all of these things. And as you say, everything's up for negotiation. But I think in this kind of a scenario, the most important thing is what do the documents that they sign say? Mm -hmm. Because some will say the time frame begins, mm -hmm. you know, when the contingency has been removed. Uh, but conversation mm -hmm. with both the buyer and the seller are important here. I, I know we're short on time, yeah, Mike, we but just to say, um, you know, this that would have been a great time to use your relationship with your home warranty company, get the home warranty to put a, a seller coverage. If you were a buyer's agent asking for a contingency, get the get the buyer's agent to order the home the home inspection for the seller, recommend that they get it, um, so that they're covered for those big major items because of the lengthiness of the potential escrow period versus a normal one. All right, scenario number five. I am representing a buyer. Our due diligence period ends tomorrow. We have not received the SPUDS or insurance claim letter. What are our options if we don't get them on time? <coughs> so I know the quick answer, but then it creates another question that I'm not sure about. Um, the, qu the quick answer is you cure them um, because they are, they, they're not fulfilling the terms of the contract. My question, though, because I think that's a simple answer. My question is, does the three-day cure period now, does it extend the due diligence period? Because I'm at day 10. I, I, I could make the assumption that if I cured them, 
then now I have 13 days. And it doesn't sound like I do, by the way, that Todd's making obnoxious faces. <laughs> um, but I want to I want to I want to <laughs> clear that up. So so you got a problem on your hands in this situation. Potentially. Yeah. Potential, Potentially. potential problem. Um, so what I would do is, the first thing that I would do is um, try to extend the due diligence period. Because that's, that's a simple answer, but that's not necessarily easy to do. And then I would, I would cure them. So this is like the reciprocal of the one we just had. <laughs> in other words, you know, now this is potentially, you know, the, the buyer who's ready and wants to perform and the seller's holding up the performance by not delivering these documents. The SPDS in the, res, in the AAR residential purchase contract says that you have five days to review that once you've received it. So, it, and again, remember, it's an advisory disclosure. It's not part of the contract. So, you know, it does not change or modify the inspection period. The only thing it does is give you five days from receipt to, to review it and sign it and send it back. And the signature is not accepting the terms of that. It's just accepting receipt of it. The insurance claim letter is different. The insurance claim letter, I don't believe, has a, you know, anything addition in there with the exception of falling under the term changes again, which then means that if they didn't get this or the HOA document to you until later, you have five days to review it. Um, but the insurance claim letter right now, from what I understand in mountain areas, so if anybody uh, up on the rim is listening, um, you've got major insurance changes because of the fires. Yep. So those rates are going ridiculously high. Down here in the valley, we got water claim issues that are really causing big issues down here. So it is a major uh, factor in whether you're even going to be able to obtain insurance on that house from a buyer's agent's perspective. And you would want to make sure that. But you still have five days from receipt of that claim letter. The question is, how long do you want to go um, and wait for that document. So I do believe the three-day cure notice would happen any time after the expiration of the due diligence period. Well, and when we look at this, the point that comes up here, I look at some of these things. When we use the words due diligence, I look at that as a red herring in this case, meaning it's just something thrown in there that can monkey it up. And the reason I'm saying that, they're already in violation as far as the time period yeah. is concerned. Mm -hmm. three days because, the, yeah, the contract says the SPUDS is supposed to be delivered within three days after contract acceptance, so it doesn't go with the due diligence. And the insurance claims letter, you know, you have the same type of a situation. And, and your point is correct. On either of these, it's upon receipt, you know, regardless of the time frame. So if we get the SPUDS now and the buyer finds something that they want to disapprove, they can cancel because it says they have five days after receipt to go through this. And the reason I mentioned this one and, and like this one, so many of us think, okay, well, wait a minute, we've got the inspection period without realizing that some of these things fall outside that. And if you have somebody who's just a little bit sharper or a little bit smoother, they can convince you that you don't have options, you don't have alternatives, yeah. you don't have that time frame, and in fact, you do. So the point of the matter is, is whether you get the, the spuds or the clue report, um, send in the bins are within the 10-day period. They could do not let that lapse, um, and at the end, of, and then you're going to cure them. Um, and at the end of the day, what happens? We get to the close of escrow, and the seller doesn't doesn't submit these documents can the buyer then say you know we've the, the clue the cure period has expired at that point then could theoretically the buyer cancel my feeling is that's possibly yeah. a, a reality however when you say the cure period has now expired and we're at the closing and they're not doing something that's when i would say Call Dwayne. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, and I'm serious yeah. with this. And yeah, sure, to be one of the managing brokers is a pleasure, but that's something where I would look at Dwayne, Dean, and Kyle and say, okay, guys, what do you think? You know, because each set of circumstances can differ, and the devil's in the details. Marge, it's always great to have you. Thanks this for coming fun. back. Yeah. That was some good stuff. Thanks. All right. Uh, just as a reminder, no podcast next Monday. Um, and uh, next week, I, you know, 
happy Thanksgiving and all that, but it's just going to be a lot of football, you know, and I'm so football. excited. You know, Nick, I got to say, last week I want to thank you for uh, uh, reminding me, and you did, because normally every year I do it, and I didn't. But, uh, you know, we are in a period of time when more people take their life between now and January 1st than any other time of the year. It's typically caused because they see other people seeing family gatherings, uh, love happening, and uh, they're not part of that anymore, maybe from... Yeah. All right. Because of a loss of a loved one or maybe even a pet. Um, but the thing is, is that they're depressed. Um, it's the first year or many years without that comfort with you. Uh, and, uh, and, and if they're already prone to disposition as it relates to, um, as it relates to depression, uh, this is what adds to it. So um, if you notice somebody missing if in the office, they're always there, but all of a sudden they're not. And you're wondering why they could be going through a state of depression. Uh, it reminds me of the Mel Gibson movie, What, w- what Women Want. And uh, he could hear their thoughts, and this girl was going to commit suicide because she believed that nobody knew whether she was there or not there. Her life didn't matter anywhere, and she was already estranged from all the other things. But he heard that, and he did. He ultimately saved her life. But you, a phone call from you could save somebody's life. So. All right. Appreciate everybody joining us today. Have a very happy Thanksgiving next week. We'll leave you with the quote of the day. Let us be grateful to the people who make us happy. They are charming gardeners who make our souls blossom. Haley, I am done Haley, with you beautiful. and your that's quote the of the day. Everybody go out and sell a home. Make some fr-